Hello there. So this video is going to be talking about enclosures for tall walls, or we could just say tall enclosures. Within the context of the building system, of course, the building enclosure is one of the four major systems that we deal with. And within the enclosure itself, one of the four fundamental performance requirements, or maybe six, depending how you look at it, is the need to provide structural support. This structural support, of course, is completely different than the superstructure's job, which is to resist and collect all the loads in the building and transfer them to the ground. The enclosure support function is just to transfer uh, the loads to the superstructure so that it can be carried by the superstructure to the ground. Now, you'll also notice this is just a review of the layers that make up the perfecting wall, and we need to make sure we get these in all of our assemblies, air, water, vapor, thermal, rain, etc. It's not just support. That said, this lecture will focus a lot on the support structure because the support layer is what distinguishes tall enclosures from all the other enclosures. Now, when we talk about the building superstructure, we have a range of building materials and systems, both gravity and lateral loads. Um, so that we've already covered. Whereas with the enclosure, the support function is often decoupled. And we're going to look into that. But um, it can be, especially in smaller and older buildings, the superstructure and the enclosure support structures can be incorporated. What I'm going to talk about today, though, is very much those systems where the support structure, the enclosure, is decoupled from the superstructure, as it very commonly is in modern buildings. Now, the support structure, the support function of a building its function is to collect and transfer wind loads and the self weight of the building enclosure to the superstructure. Then the superstructure deals with those lateral and gravity loads. I've posted a document on Learn called uh, Sizing because oftentimes we are just trying to get a, a basic dimension that makes sense when we're doing either analysis or in doing design. And so I put down a general set of rules and guidance in this short document about sizing. And we're going to look at that, how it applies, say, to tall building enclosures uh, in this presentation. But before we do that, I'd also like to look at just reminding you of the standard component sizes that I'm going to assume you know. Uh, we, we purchase and produce many components in standardized sizes. And in terms of design, you like to use and take advantage of those standard sizes. And in terms of analysis, by looking at a building, you should know it's very likely a standard size component unless you have strong evidence otherwise. So here's just a list here of a number of different sizes and shapes that you might use um, for different components that make up a building enclosure. Now, we do need to think about uh, the support structure and its design and how this might affect our building's analysis and building performance. The approach taken to the design of the structural support as part of a building enclosure is fairly straightforward. Most of our building enclosures support structures are simply supported beams that happen to span vertically. So if I have a, a typical enclosure support structure and I'm going to put a, a generic foundation wall on it, there we are, um, and it's going to be supported here at the top and it will be supported at the bottom. These connections at top and bottom are almost always, if it ends like this, pin connected structures. Now, if I'm talking about a typical one story structure, um, and I'm going to make this a commercial, but residential, whatever, and that resistance at the top is provided by the roof structure, 
and up the bottom by the slab on grade or the first floor structure. The thing that's interesting is that here is my height of my structural support system. And what is that H for different types of buildings? So uh, H is likely to be something for an office. It might be, oh, 3.6 meters. That would be for an office building. For a common residential building, it might be 2.5 to 3.0 meters, depending on what kind of a class, mostly more expensive buildings have these higher floors. And in fact, in $20 million condos, we should expect that this residential be actually closer to say six meters. Now for buildings like pools, big box retail, uh, buildings such as rec centers, convention centers, shopping malls, uh, we will often see floor span, uh, uh, floor to ceiling heights of six to even 12 meters. Now 12 meters is probably pushing it, but we're seeing a definite trend moving in that direction. Now the challenge we have now, of course, is that this span, if it approaches even six meters, a typical assembly that we would use for a multi-story building. And I'm gonna draw here some multi-story buildings that might look like, let me just do a concrete slab, make this say it's a, um, an office or something like that. Well, the H that we're dealing with is, could be center to center of floors if the enclosure actually just spans from center to center. Now, many times we would actually make a structural support system that spans from the top of the floor to the bottom of that perimeter beam. So that's a different type of a system. So it's slightly different, right? Uh, by the depth of that perimeter floor beam system. So those are the kind of ranges that we would have for a multi-story building and what the H might be. Now in these multi-story buildings, H is much more likely to be in the 3.6 to, uh, you know, or so meters, two and a half to 3.6 meters. Whereas uh, in these single story buildings like conference centers and so on, we're much more likely to see uh, these very high t uh, H's. Now, if we look at how we would design a very tall enclosure wall system, we don't just have a single span. Obviously, if it were a single span and it acted like a simply supported beam, which most building enclosure systems do, regardless of whether we're talking CMUs or steel stud, or curtain walls, well, we are used to using a typical um, WL squared over eight, uh, where W is the uniformly distributed load in kilonewtons per linear meter or pounds per linear foot. We have the length uh, typically in feet or meters. And so then we know that the maximum moment is at the middle and it's equal to WL squared over eight. So that's a pretty well understood. Also, and these are some equations that you should commit really to either memory or being really close at hand because you'll use them an awful lot. The deflection at the mid span, which is the max, is 384 over EI. And so the E and the I tell you that um, it's both a material and a geometry specific uh, adjustments can be made to minimize the deflection at mid span. Now the moment, as many of you will know, has a shape that looks something like that, which is actually maybe a little bit more parabolic than I have drawn. So, all right, that's the simple approach. Now, if I wanted to control either, uh, control the deflection so I could actually span further, one of the obvious things to do 
is to turn this into a multi-span continuous beam. And that's important, that the beam be continuous over this middle support. Now, when we're looking at this again, we're still looking at this being L. And of course, these UDLs, uh, uniformly distributed load, UDL, uh, is given the load intensity is given uh, a value of W. Interestingly, the maximum moment is actually the same. And that is because the moment uh, profile under this condition looks something like this. And the moment over the support is a maximum and it is WL squared over eight, which is of course the same as if it were a single span. However, this two span continuous beam has uh, something else going for it. And that is that its maximum deflection is WL to the fourth over 185 EI. Now I will spare you the math and tell you that the if you put in these numbers you'll find that this is 2.4 times less and it's clearly time for another um, a different uh, uh, marker 2.4. So the big advantage of doing this continuous span for a UDL is that it reduces the mid span deflection by a factor of two and a half. And that means that I can span a larger distance without having to be controlled by any kind of deflection. Now, Another thing to consider here though, is that sometimes we have building enclosures which are actually act more like a cantilever system. And so this is my cantilever uh, support. If I were to have a beam that was L long with a UDL of W on it, my maximum moment is equal to WL squared over two. So for the same span, four times as much moment. Um, but even more interestingly, the maximum bending, uh, the maximum deflection, I mean, um, is equal to WL to the four over eight EI. And that means that for a cantilever, you actually end up with this being 9.6 times more deflection. So if you're worrying about deflection, and in many building systems, if we are trying to be slender, deflection is what governs, not strength, actually. It's an important lesson to learn. Um, we would like to have a continuous beam as opposed to a, um, a beam that is either cantilever from a support at the bottom uh, or a symbol, single span. So as has been described, the span distance is the distance between floors if you're talking about a wall. A wall being a, mostly acting as a vertical beam in the support function, acting as a vertical beam column if the superstructure and the support structure are combined. So understanding a little bit about standard depth of uh, span ratios for a, say a typical three meter, 10 foot height, we would expect the depth of the support components of the assembly to be about 1 15th or 1 20th of that distance. So for a span of 10 feet, three meters, very common height, um, that would be something about 150 millimeters deep. Um, and that is also a very common dimension for steel studs, uh, for curtain walls. Masonry, especially hollow concrete masonry, 
often we see it a little bit thicker uh, and for that height. And so that was why we would see a nominal 200 millimeter CMU commonly used for that height of three meters. But now let's move to the six meter height. And now we end up with something a little bit different. So we would probably need something like 250, 300 millimeter thickness to make those span to depth ratios work. And as you go beyond six meters, they get those dimensions start to become quite large. Now, uh, another resource on Learn is Ed Allen's Architect Studio Companion. And you can see the span to depth ratios for some types of systems, particularly pre-stressed concrete, can be quite a bit more slender than that. And that is something that is a feature of pre-stressed concrete in general and absolutely is uh, a value in making slender walls that span quite a large vertical height. Now, when you're thinking through the tall enclosure wall and how it works on a building, the interaction between the support function and the superstructure is quite important. And to understand or select this is important uh, to a good design. Now, the one of the things that is created, a problem that's created by having a support function separate from the superstructure is that we have to manage differential movements between these two systems. In particular, we don't want deflections caused by gravity movement to cause unintended forces on a support structure who is only designed to take, say, the wind load. So that's a classic uh, concern. If I were to look at, say, a, a load-bearing masonry or site cast concrete or even CLT, solid wall support structure, like at a shear wall, um, we would put the control layers and exterior finish to the outdoors of that. And from a point of view of the interaction of the superstructure, well, it is the superstructure. And so we've combined the floors bearing on those types of walls to perform a load-bearing superstructure combined with enclosure. But if we wanted to use a relatively heavy cladding system and decouple it from the superstructure, we would use an approach more like this diagram shown from Ching's uh, textbook. And in this case, you can see the horizontal arrows are the wind loads. The vertical arrows are the gravity loads. And it shows how the loads would be collected and transmitted to the floor slabs in this case. This is something that we would do if the cladding is able to span the full distance between floors, which is certainly the case for say precast concrete claddings and relatively thick, like 150 or 200 millimeter thick masonry. Now what's more normal uh, today at least is that the exterior cladding is kept thinner, uh, especially if it's masonry. And that might be the standard 90 millimeter masonry veneer. And the wind loads therefore, the lateral green arrows here, collect that wind load and transfer it to a support structure, which could be CLT, could be steel stud, uh, could be CMUs. Uh, but the gravity loads, the weight of that masonry is quite substantial. And so it is collected and, and uh, held up at each floor and transferred over to the superstructure at each floor. So in this case, the lateral loads have a transfer path that goes through the support structure. The gravity self weight of the veneer cladding is accumulated and collected at each floor. So the other way of looking at this would be a precast concrete. This is a very common system. And this concrete is stronger and stiffer than is a masonry veneer. And that means it can span floor to floor with a thickness of 120, 150 millimeters, say. And so it does collect up the wind loads and transfer them only at the floors. Uh, and the gravity loads are also collected only at the floors. In this case, the enclosure support is really not taking the wind load. Uh, it is only being there to hold on to interior finishes, 
allow for service distribution, places for insulation, and so forth. Now, another approach that would be the most modern wall and look a lot like the perfect wall would be a support structure with no insulation in it, a control layer of air, water, and vapor on the exterior of that support, and then continuous insulation and a lightweight cladding. Now, what's interesting about this is notice that both gravity and lateral wind loads are collected and taken to the support structure fairly often at each size of panel or something like that. And so the gravity loads are actually accumulated um, in the support structure, not in the exterior. And that allows us to use cladding and move it around in any kind of weird ways because it's always transferred per panel back to the support structure. And like I said, this is what's used for lightweight cladding systems, panelized, corrugated steel metal, and even some moderate weight products like sometimes terracotta, thin porcelain tiles, etc. So those are three ways of approaching the cladding superstructure interaction. And another way that is a little special case occurs when we have non-load bearing windows that penetrate all the way through the middle of an enclosure. And this is sometimes what we see with ribbon windows, but we also just see it in spandrel panels itself. And if I wanted to find spandrel panel, it's that sort of opaque, almost always opaque area, which is just above and below the floor. If we don't let the beam span from floor to floor, the beam of the support structure, well, then we have our work cut out for us to be able to transfer in particular lateral loads to the floors because the panel will want to rotate around the single point of connection. And what that means is that we use some sort of a triangulization uh, to support two parts that are separated by a meaningful distance, maybe a meter, preferably more, on that external uh, support structure for the, at the spandrel area. So this is not always needed. It's, it's a bit more annoying and complicated to do. But if you want to have a very large wide slit through your enclosure, because a ribbon window being a classic example, this is how it's done. And it is a fairly common, although it is a... All right, so now let's take a look at some of the practical systems that are used and how they're used in tall enclosure wall applications. I've got a list of six here. That's not exhaustive, but it does cover most of the common ones. The oldest would be almost certainly masonry walls. In the old days, brick, clay brick masonry, but today it's almost always concrete masonry units, units that are hollow, and uh, we allow reinforcing to be used to fill in those hollow spaces in CMU and this becomes quite important for seismic regions or higher loads, although it does add significantly to the cost. Ching doesn't describe tall masonry walls as used in most of North America uh, very well. So a little bit of information here on how that's done. A better source of information would be something like the Masonry Institute. These images here are showing what would be very economical and normal to say, I want a seven meter, eight meter, even nine meter high masonry wall that fills it within a structural steel framework. Quite a common system for rec centers, big box stores, movie theaters, swimming pools, etc. Now, notice none of the enclosure layers are shown in these drawings. So this is just the support in red, superstructure in red, the gray support structure made of CMU. And then we put membranes on the outside of this, make them continuous, wrap it with insulation, make it continuous, and then add our cladding over top. This is actually a, a couple of photos uh, from the addition made to CPH at the University of Waterloo campus. Uh, 
and it was done quite a you know 10 years ago 12 years ago i guess um, and you can see the steel superstructure the lecture hall is pretty tall at this location so this is really pushing how high a 300 millimeter deep cmu wall would go but again cmu was being chosen here for fire sound durability impact resistance and so while it's not the lowest cost way of filling in that space in the superstructure um, it certainly is a traditional one and you can see that uh, the cmu can span quite a height this is a close-up view of that while they're installing the first steps of the membrane they've begun the membrane uh, at the joints which is not an uncommon approach before they added the complete membrane over the other areas and then insulation now don't uh, misunderstand that there are a lot of older buildings out there that look like this beauty right here and this is a CMU wall, single wythe, load bearing. And we built an awful lot of industrial buildings in the 70s, 80s, and 90s like this, but it doesn't have any insulation. So it is the concrete masonry unit, uh, single layer, uninsulated. Sometimes they would add insulation on the inside, uh, creating some challenges from a building science perspective. And the other thing to notice about this building is that on the left side, you'll see they've painted it. And that's not just paint. That's an elastomeric coating to minimize the amount of water that penetrates through. So that's a challenge with these single wide systems, which is why they are rarely used anymore for modern and high performance enclosures. Sometimes you have CMUs that look um, well, have a little bit more texture and color to them. And that would be on the left side of this image. This is called split-faced concrete block. It is a load-bearing, single-wide system, but it has insulation, two inches of styrofoam insulation, actually, added to the inside and then gypsum board. Um, however, the sidewalls here you'll see are covered with uh, metal cladding and that's to improve the rainwater performance again, but also uh, they were adding insulation to the outside of a standard eight inch CMU wall, uh, and then insulation and then membrane, uh, they mean then cladding. And this is about a seven uh, meter high. This is a rec center, uh, an arena, and the bottom part of this arena is using CMUs not as a structural element, but actually as a larger scale cladding system. And the superstructure in this building is actually a pre-engineered steel uh, system. And it was actually very convenient that they could span by using CMUs higher vertical distances, but there's still brick ties in this system and it's really more of a standard veneer system. So the second system I thought I would talk about being steel studs is very common. We use for three to four or five meter uh, floor to ceiling heights, commercial institutional buildings, dominant in the marketplace. It's very flexible in terms of design fast to build, weather insensitive, uh, etc. Lots of benefits. However, as we go taller, as we get to the six, eight, nine meter range, we definitely need to use studs that are, or framing elements that are much deeper than we're used to. So gone are the 150 millimeter studs and we start seeing 250, even 300 or more for extremely tall walls. With respect to incorporating the building enclosure layering, uh, it's pretty straightforward uh, that we would put sheathing, uh, gypsum usually sheathing so it doesn't burn, uh, then a membrane, then insulation, then the cladding of your choice. Um, I'm showing these images here with insulation within the stud space, which means it's not the perfect wall, but provided there's enough insulation on the outside to avoid condensation, this is a valid approach. This is an example showing how 
the steel studs are actually running outside the superstructure. This is a very common choice in one story type tall buildings because it allows the steel studs to cantilever past the roof and make a parapet and allow for good structural stiffness. This is an office type building. Um, the floor to ceiling heights are a little bit uh, around six, seven meters. And so this is sort of the limit at which you could get away with a 150 millimeter stud. These are 200 millimeter studs. This is a grocery store being built in the Waterloo region. The steel studs in this case have been sunk flush with the steel superstructure. So the exterior is flat. Uh, and on the right hand side, you see that the, of this slide, they've added the gypsum sheathing. And also you'll notice that they have a mezzanine here. So they have a tall wall situation um, for on the left hand side, which is again, probably seven, eight meters high. And then they have split it in half with a mezzanine as you'd call it, where we have two more normal four meter high walls. Very simple to execute with a steel stud type system. This type of uh, steel stud within a, a structural steel framework is all over the place in one story type buildings, particularly the retail buildings have higher floor to ceiling heights and so are highly relevant to this lecture. You'll see them poking through in the image on the left and we're adding a gypsum sheathing the membrane is a liquid applied membrane. You'll see the color there uh, being shown uh, around the edge. And then the white is actually 50 millimeters of expanded polystyrene. And then we have the finish being applied at the corner. Let me see, show, walk around the corner. You can look at now the color and texture uh, of the desired finish at the same time as seeing all the layers on the left side. A complete building would look something like this. Now this doesn't just highlight the steel stud system uh, as a support for tall enclosures. It also indicates something more about a certain type of enclosure system called EIFS or exterior insulation finish system. Now let's talk about number three uh, as a system and that would be precast. This is a prefabricated system made of concrete. We don't even use the word concrete when we say precast because it's often implied. Um, there are two broad types of these, the sandwich and the single wythe or architectural precast is another word for the single wythe. Um, this is a, a, an excerpt from the Qing textbook and I'll show you a little bit more here about the layering inside. On the left, we have the sandwich panel, which is actually a full building enclosure. You know, you don't have to put anything on the inside. The inside concrete layer is usually the structural support layer, but it's also, it can be a fireproof interior finish if you like concrete. Um, then we have the insulation in the middle and the outer layer tends to be the water control layer, air control layer, uh, etc. So that's a complete enclosure. On the right hand side with the single layer system, we are really relying on the concrete as an exterior finish only. It's stiff and strong, so it can span quite a distance, but we have to add insulation to the interior and some air tightness, potentially fire resistance needs to be addressed depending, and certainly some finish needs to be added to make it attractive. Here's a couple of images of sandwich panels. These panels tend to be thicker because they incorporate two layers of concrete, the thicker support layer on the inside, the thinner cladding layer, which is often only maybe uh, 65 millimeters thick, um, with 100 and so millimeters of insulation these days in between those two wides. So for big box stores, very popular. Uh, these panels tend to come in 2.4 meter uh, wide widths, and that's so that they can be easily trucked. 
uh, but you can get custom widths. And then the height here uh, in this particular building was pretty, pretty high. It was over eight meters because the interior of the building was eight meters and these projected over top of and formed the parapet as well. Um, on the left-hand side, we see a, a, a project that is eventually going to be a two-story school. So this is an interesting sandwich panel that's not just a cladding support structure. Uh, it is also the load-bearing superstructure. Not common, but you know, be aware it exists. Now, almost everything we can talk about with precast, you can also use with what's called tilt-up construction. Not very popular in the northeastern part of the United States and Canada, but is popular in the west and southwest. And so uh, should at least know it exists. Um, look it up. This is 5.13 from Ching. Just read that uh, short chat section to understand a bit more. Now, precast is used in a lot of tall a wall situations because it has some of those structural characteristics and it's easy to construct prefabricated and lift the whole thing in one go and what you see here this is actually tesla's gigafactory being built in berlin and so the the floor to ceiling height here is i'm guessing from scale but it looks to be something like 12 meters and the concrete panels there on the left side are visible along with the steel superstructure on the right hand side. This is another uh, project I'll talk about more, but this is the University of Waterloo Field House. The interior of this structure is over 15 meters. And as you can see, the precast concrete panels being applied to the steel structure, superstructure, uh, project upward and, and form a parapet, which is not uncommon. Now, when you're at these heights, it's usually economical to break the precast span, if not the panel, but at least the span into shorter distances. And in this project, you'll see that we have the highlighted in purple, these things that are called girts that I wanna look into. And they basically reduce the span into manageable chunks. And for this building, the manageable chunks were aligned with also windows. So there's windows going to go into this opening. Um, and so it was quite an economical design to have the panels only have to span maybe six to eight meters. And the window opening of three to four meters is provided. And the structural loads go from the precast panel right into the superstructure at the girts, at the roof, or at the floor. So girts and purlins are something that are very important for being able to do tall wall enclosures. So I want to talk a bit about those. So how do we typically deal with buildings that have very high story heights or tall, I'm going to call them tall enclosures. Uh, as I said, it's, you know, typically these are one story, but they certainly could be on a multi-story basis. So I'm going to draw what might be a shopping mall perimeter. There's an I-beam and there's a superstructure and that superstructure uh, is supported here. There's a, could be a column system which would go down to a deep footing of some sort out of sight um, but this acts this is a roof diaphragm that pushes back structurally on any of the loads that are collected by the enclosure system now actually i'll draw the loads here they're imposing loads on the footing. And you can see the tributary area there for that vertical beam is going to be H. Now, to manage the depth of this, and this is D, we know that we typically have span to depth ratios 
of around oh 20 to as much as 40 if you're doing really pushing your luck uh, to one but if you want to minimize D because if, if H is high um, greater than about 3.6 meters just to pick a number we'll often split the span up by having a cross member and that cross member is called a girt or sometimes it's called a purlin although purlins are more strictly speaking used in roofs uh, to do the same function which is to minimize that span and so if I look at this in plan view I will see that there are columns then there are girts and then there is the enclosure now these columns need to be able to take now the load imposed by the enclosure wall that's transmitted through to the girt so as you can see if I add that purlin I now have a tributary area that's actually larger for that middle girt than it is for either the bottom connection or the top connection and so that turns that column into more of a beam column because they have to resist this vertical load this, this is horizontal load from the girt um, that being said by reducing the span the effective span uh, in half for that enclosure uh, it really makes a big difference in terms of the structural viability of typical enclosure systems and for many practical enclosure systems when you start getting into heights of seven and a half nine or twelve meters to mention some of the taller uh, H available then it becomes very uh, common and very sensible to basically put in uh, girts and purlins and sometimes those girts and purlins can be spaced as closely as 1.2 meters apart so item number four on my list of common tall wall enclosure systems is the insulated metal panel and it often relies on girts to span large distances but it is commonly used for this purpose so a insulated metal panel or IMP is literally just two sheets of thin sheet metal less than a millimeter thick often corrugated to uh, make sure that it stays wrinkle free glued in the factory to load bearing foam insulation and by load bearing I mean wind load bearing these panels do not carry any vertical load cannot carry any vertical load um, they are only used in the wind and self weight categories of load so a pure enclosure support structure and they have some uh, pretty interesting features that can be quite useful have become much more popular in North America although they've been popular in Europe for quite some time this is a sort of a three-dimensional ISO just to show how the insulated metal panel can literally just be attached to the structural superstructure of say in this case HSS to provide a complete building enclosure and that is done in industrial and some back of house areas of big retail where the metal panel on the inside is your interior finish um, and the metal on the outside is your exterior finish and all of the enclosure functions are provided by this panel and although there are limits to how you can use these systems uh, particularly fire and impact resistance and a certain narrow range of aesthetics they are often the most economical solution here's a couple of uh, images of insulated metal panels in use uh, the image on the right is from a rec center uh, and it is spanning about six or so meters between girts 
the image on the left is an insulated metal panel that is ending at a architectural detail that is made of steel studs and gypsum. And it allows us to look into the edges of a horizontally applied panel, whereas the panels on the right are clearly vertically oriented, which is quite common. This is a car dealership, um, and you can see the vertical span of these panels. The panels are continuous here from the footing to the parapet, even though this is a two-story structure, and so therefore it doesn't have a really long span. That said, you can see that there are uh, the edges uh, are, are supported here by a pretty heavy-duty girt. Uh, for that span that is uh, otherwise only about maybe four meters. If you look on the inside, you'll see these girts uh, are common even in industrial systems. It's often the most economical. However, if uh, you get a thick enough panel, which people are starting to do to get better thermal performance, if you get the 150 millimeter panel or even the, one, the 200 millimeter panel, you can span quite some distance without requiring a girt, if that's uh, important for design. Here we are back to the Berlin, uh, Tesla's Berlin Gigafactory. Um, in some parts they used precast, and in some parts they used insulated metal panels. And the reason for the distinction will almost certainly have to do with the need for impact resistance, sound separation, or fire separation. And precast concrete does those three things really well, and insulated metal panels, not so much. So you get to pick where you put them uh, depending on what's driving the, the design. So our second from last encl enclosure system for tall walls um, are, is curtain walls. So we often need to have curtain walls or windows in our buildings. And if you have tall enclosure walls, there's often a need to have tall curtain walls. And the image on the left is from the University of Waterloo's Davis Center in the atrium. And so these are rather tall uh, continuous and unbroken curtain walls are probably 15 meters before they even hit the curve. On the right hand side we have the Art Gallery of Ontario, Frank Gehry type project, um, and here the they're not as tall but they're interestingly integrated with a wood superstructure and you can see interior shading at the top. So won't go into too much detail about curtain walls um, there's information in Ching about how the systems work and, and go together, but uh, I'm going to spend more time about how to get these curtain walls to span tall distances. So um, normally when I look at a curtain wall that's in a catalog, we expect it to span three and a half to four and a half meters. The normal office building floor to ceiling height, for example. However, you can often get 200 and 250 millimeter deep uh, tubes, the support structure part of a curtain wall. Those are often used when you just want to go to, say, a front entrance to a store and you want to go to six meters. Um, but if you start getting over about six meters, you almost always see the use of intermediate structures in the form of, of girts or equivalent. Um, I'll sort of show how this works when it comes to the Davis Center. Um, the image at the right is unaltered and the image at the left, I've tried to label how this works. The six inch uh, tubes of the aluminum curtain wall collect the wind and self load, but they transfer it fairly often to this mid-span HSS girt that goes from column to column. And those concrete columns are obviously part of the superstructure uh, and they take the load from the girt and they transfer it into the superstructure of beams and columns and braces. Now other ways of doing this uh, on the left hand side we see a airport in Quebec City rather tall uh, but you can do this much taller and what I've tried to outline there in red is the 
um, the cable truss that they've created. So they actually have a central pipe and then they have for uh, web cords, they uh, ensure their intention by basically duplicating the structure around that tube. And that is a very interesting to look at and open sort of a truss that supports the lateral loads imposed by that curtain wall. And so that is a truss type uh, resisting system. On the right hand side, we see from the Smithsonian in Washington, DC, uh, you'll notice some of the glazing units are failing, but that's a building science problem. Um, and there are tubular trusses being formed in board of that curtain wall to support that large vertical height of curtain wall. And so really what we see is you, you at a certain height, you stop using the aluminum tubes to support the larger and larger loads. And instead you use a secondary structure of some form, girts, truss, uh, trusses made out of cables, trusses made out of pipes. Another option is in this case was just make a complete grill of circular tubes. Now these tubes were rather large. Uh, I don't know the precise dimension, but I seem to think they were in the order of 200 to 250 millimeter diameter, um, painted white and rounded so they have less visual impact. And then the glazing curtain wall system was just attached to those at discrete points, the corners actually, of each of those aluminum frames. And that allowed this conference center to have a very large atrium um, and span that distance. Another uh, convention center, this happens to be in Hawaii, um, has used glass fins as the support structure. So again, it, it all comes down to the span over depth ratio. And when you have a large distance to span, you need something deep. And so the challenge for designers is how, how do I get that vertical span whilst minimizing the visual obstruction of a, the required deep support. Well, open trusses is one way, uh, glass fins is another. Uh, so obviously glass fins aren't transparent. You can see, especially on an angle, reflections in the green of the iron in the glass, but it's pretty open. Um, and so that's another technique that you will see in buildings using glass fins to support uh, the lateral loads. So finally, uh, item number six, not really a great enclosure wall system, but it is commonly used with pre-engineered steel structures. And these pre-engineered steel structures sell this type of system with them. And so you will see it a lot. The, the finish is essentially always exterior corrugated steel. Um, those girts labeled number three uh, are hidden from view and they support the metal um, cladding. Then the, the girts labeled number one are actually the structural girts that collect the wind loads and transfer them to the columns. Um, these are often filled with insulation, uh, low density fiberglass, and the performance with respect to thermal bridging, water penetration, and particularly air leakage is pretty bad. We can make these a bit better and they've definitely improved over the last decade or two, but they're still considered a relatively moderate performance or low performance system. The lowest cost systems are the ones that look like this where they actually have what I call a plastic bag of insulation on the inside. Um, so they have a facer, almost always white, uh, reinforced polymer facer that is just draped over all of the subgirts that you see spanning horizontally between columns. And you'll notice this one here on the right, they've actually haven't put, even put the roof on yet, but the walls are going up. Um, and these are serviceable, but they're usually not high performance. So you don't want people uh, interacting with them too much, either mechanically causing damage uh, or uh, experiencing their aesthetics, which great for a machinery shop or something like that, but not so much for higher finish buildings.
So um, I guess in conclusion here, I've taken a pretty quick look at tall enclosure walls. And they have the same air, water, vapor, thermal requirements. What makes them special is that for longer spans, we use different solutions to meet that support need. And that also makes us worry a bit more about how to build things and drives us to more panelized and prefabricated systems so we don't have to build scaffolding, etc. So although I've shown you what I think are the more common ones, um, you pretty much can build anything you want uh, in a tall enclosure wall if you use, for example, girts to limit the span to three meters. So anything you use for three meters can now be used for 30 meters, if you wish, by having a bunch of girts. Um, but the, for the reasons I've pointed out in terms of constructability and economics, those six systems I, I presented are well over 90% of all of the tall enclosure walls you're going to find. So thanks for listening, and I'll see you in the next one.